started. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, respected colleagues and guests. Welcome to this month's Ummatics Colloquium. Uh, my name is Hannah Aisha and I'm Outreach Coordinator at Ummatics. And as always, we're happy to welcome people who are here for the first time and those of you who are our returning attendees. Today's event promises to be a very exciting conversation entitled Anomatic Universalism. Transnational jihadism is undoubtedly the most securitized discourse on Muslims globally. There is perhaps no other phenomena that has faced greater scrutiny with the motivations, ambitions, and methods by which Muslims provide military support to their brothers and sisters in both the heartlands and the margins of the Muslim world under the microscope. This combination of Islamic piety, international mobility, and violence stands in direct opposition to the nation state, which sees violence as legitimate only when exercised under the monopoly of the state. From the historic cases of Afghanistan and Chechnya to the more recent examples of Iraq and Syria, security studies sees jihadism as inextricably connected to forms of radicalism and thus must eventually constitute a threat to the international order. But it is these narratives that Dr. Darrell Lee queries in his 2020 book, The Universal Enemy, Jihad, Empire and the Challenge of Solidarity. His book seeks to compare the notion and practice of modern jihad, not invariably as terrorism, but as an alternate universalism, an nomadic universalism. Through a decade long study of the case of Bosnia that features interviews with foreign fighters from half a dozen countries, he examines how transnational jihad operates as an instrument of pan-Islamic solidarity, not simply in opposition to the West, but as a genuine attempt to construct a politics of belonging in contemporary warfare. This important work refutes much of the established wisdom in security studies and paves the way for today's important conversation. Can we speak then of an umatic universalism? We're very grateful to have Dr. Lee with us today for this discussion. Uh, Dr. Darrell Lee is an assistant professor of anthropology and associate member of the law school at the University of Chicago. He is an anthropologist and attorney working at the intersection of war, law, migration, empire, and race, with a focus on trans-regional linkages between the Middle East, South Asia, and the Balkans. Dr. Lee's book is, of course, available to purchase in full, but he has kindly submitted some short remarks on how his work reflects a nomadic framing for our colloquium members to read, and this will have been emailed to all of you previously. Our respondent for today uh, is Dr. Basit Iqbal. Dr. Basit is an assistant professor of anthropology at McMaster University. His work explores the ethical formations, aesthetic sensibilities, and political theologies of contemporary Islam. So our event today will start with Dr. Lee presenting his paper for about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, and then as usual, we'll be followed by the respondent, Dr. Iqbal, who will speak for about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, we'll then give you a brief chance to respond, uh, Dr. Lee, before moving on to uh, the open floor discussion and the, the question and answer session. But I'll stop here uh, and I'll hand over to you, Dr. Lee. Uh, the virtual floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, I'm really honored uh, to be in conversation with you. Um, so thank you to all of the organizers, especially Omarir and Uthman for inviting me. Um, and uh, Basit, um, I'm, I'm so excited to finally be in conversation with you uh, because I, I really, I, I respect your scholarship so much and I find your ideas so fascinating. So I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, Hannah, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I think you basically uh, shaved five minutes off my book talk by doing such a great job of situating the, the intervention and sort of uh, the problematic that I'm responding to in this book and, and that I've been writing against. Um, so you've, you've done a service uh, to us all in that sense, because less of me talking is never a bad thing. Um, I'm going to uh, put some slides up. So if you'll bear with me on the technical, I think... Okay, does that work? Can you see that? Okay, all right. So I'm going to um, turn my, uh, sorry, you, you would think that after however many years that we would have figured this out, but um, I can't seem to find the, um, ah, okay, so I'm turning my camera off. Um, so um, as Hannah was saying, the universal enemy, 
uh, really focuses on a, on a specific variety of contemporary jihad practices, uh, namely those that involve transnational mobilization involving um, the use of armed force. And um, as again, as Hannah said, uh, this is often done in in kind of invoking a particular idea of the ummah. And it's these mobilizations in particular among the great variety of modern invocations of jihad that have aroused the greatest notoriety uh, precisely because of the way in which they combine notions of um, transnational mobility, violence, and piety in ways that challenge not just the nation state, but also the nation state order. And um, I decided to look into this phenomenon specifically through the case study of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina and the war in the 1990s. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this history. I won't go into it in great detail, but suffice to say, uh, between 1992 and 1995, there was a war or rather a series of wars in the former Yugoslavia and Southeast Europe in which um, Muslim populations faced incredible mass violence, uh, genocidal massacres, ethnic cleansing. Actually, the term ethnic cleansing entered the global media lexicon um, as a result of the events in this part of the world. And um, the Bosnia crisis um, aroused considerable humanitarian sympathy and interest in Western Europe and the United States. And it was symptomatic of this uh, historical moment of the, um, the immediate aftermath of the end of the Cold War and the United States trying to figure out how to reorganize and justify its position of um, unipolar military supremacy in the world. So one of the um, competing ideologies for justifying American empire at this time was, of course, uh, an idea of sort of humanitarian policing. So the mass atrocities in Bosnia kind of fed into that narrative, but it was also the specificity of their European location um, that also aroused considerable interest, right? Because at this time, there were also other sort of um, incidents of mass violence in other parts of the world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, that didn't resonate with elites in the United States and in Western Europe in quite the same way. Um, and that's specifically connected, again, to the European location of Bosnia and to this idea that, um, uh, that you know, basically of whiteness, right? So um, the images such as the one on the right, which is from the Serb-run Omarska concentration camp in Northwest Bosnia, um, resonated with images that were recirculating around the 50th anniversary commemorations of the Holocaust at this time. Um, so there's been a lot, and of course this occasioned um, any number of international interventions. So the largest ever at the time UN peacekeeping force was deployed in the country, uh, a, uh, international court was set up for war crimes and other atrocities that then became the model for the International Criminal Court. So Bosnia has this special place in the story of um, humanitarian and kind of liberal interventionist projects um, emanating from, from the West. Um, what has received less scholarly attention is the fact that the Bosnia crisis also aroused um, incredible interest and sympathy and mobilization from Muslim communities worldwide. Um, not only, of course, in the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia, but also Muslims living in Europe and the United States. And uh, the, the, uh, the wide variety of, um, of solidaristic efforts, again, invoking some idea of ummah, um, have gone pretty largely unexplored. And they range from um, different kinds of um, relief, charitable aid efforts, um, political mobilization, protests, trying to pressure governments to, to, take, a, a, to, to take a different course of action vis-a-vis -vis Bosnia, um, uh, sort of um, reformist and proselytizing efforts as well. So different kinds of da'wah activities um, also were, were an important part of this mobilization. And then finally, uh, there's of course mobilization in the context of, of armed action or jihad. Now the jihad mobilization of course has attracted uh, disproportionate attention um, from the kind of uh, Western security commentariat. And in a way, my book is kind of guilty of just sort of falling into that and reifying that disproportionate distribution of attention. So I'm very conscious of that and want to just, you know, um, put that out there. And also in the context of the Omatics conversation, I want to be very explicit that um, the jihad mobilization, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment, 
is really only one and not necessarily the most important and certainly not the most prominent of what we can call umatic projects in solidarity with Bosnia, right? So um, most of the work, mo most of the most of the Muslims in the world who are trying to do things to help Bosnia were were pursuing it through methods other than jihad. And that tends to be overlooked. It doesn't attract the same attention because it doesn't activate necessarily the same anxieties around sovereignty and international politics and violence. Um, specifically, I want to draw attention to some of the um, uh, more active nation states that were involved in the Bosnia crisis. Um, so Turkey was obviously a significant player. Uh, Turkey sent troops who participated in the UN peacekeeping force. Um, and one of the interesting things about the Turkish debate on Bosnia, which I don't have a ton of familiarity with, but my basic sense is that um, sympathy with Bosnia was um, one of the few issues that actually united um, Kemalists and um, the sort of Refah party people at this time, right? Because of various sort of historical legacies and memories connected to Ottomanism as well. Um, and of course, because of the very, very significant presence of a Bosnian diaspora in Turkey. Um, so, so there's the so there's the, the Turkish aspect of it. Of course, Iran was also quite active, and this is really the period um, of the late 80s, 1990s, when the um, when the Iranian revolution had a greater purchase across uh, sectarian identities than it might today. Um, so even some of the people I write about who were, of course, self-identified Sunni um, Mujahids uh, had a particular um, respect for and, and, and interest in the Iranian revolution as a model for political action, um, which is something that's you know, interesting to think about in light of so many things that have happened in the subsequent decades. Um, so Iran was active on many fronts. Um, in particular, uh, they did send weapons um, sort of circumventing a UN arms embargo, and they have the tacit acceptance of the United States in this regard. Um, they also sent um, uh, military personnel as trainers. And actually, there's a, there's a very, very famous story in the Bosnian War of a tunnel that connected the capital, Sarajevo, to the outside world because Sarajevo was besieged by Serb nationalist forces and the siege, you know, um, was a kind of mediatized event for all of the world. And this tunnel was uh, one of the few lifelines that people in Sarajevo had to, to enter and leave, to, to access the outside world, to get supplies. And um, it turns out that the idea for this tunnel was actually floated by um, an Iranian military advisor to the Bosnian army um, who was drawing from experiences that he had had in the uh, in the war against Iraq in the 1980s. Um, anyway, so uh, as a, and one of the odd side effects of this is that the jihad mobilizations that I'm going to talk about in a moment um, tend to be kind of grouped with the efforts of the, the, Gulf Cooperation Council states, especially Saudi Arabia, right? And it turns out that, that actually is not true. So I'll say a little bit about these jihad mobilizations. Over the course of the war, several thousand, I'm going to guess upwards of three, maybe 4,000 Muslims from around the world um, traveled to Bosnia and also participated in combat there in one way or another. And I say traveled and participated because uh, we tend to overestimate the degree of intentionality that people have when they travel. So one of the things that came up in my interviews was the fact that people often travel to Bosnia because they wanted to help fellow Muslims, but the modality through which they were exercising solidarity um, tended to vary according to other circumstances. So I know people who went intending to fight, but actually ended up doing aid work instead, or people who went thinking they would do aid work, but then ended up fighting. Um, but anyway, as far as the fighters are concerned, uh, around the middle of the war, um, the Bosnian government uh, decided to organize them into a special unit or kativa um, that uh, was about 1,000 or 1,200 strong at its peak. And it was about half Bosnian, half foreign, and most of the foreigners were Arab. Um, so as we can see, like the, in this slide, the uh, the iconography of the Katiba was very much a sort of um, umatic one, for lack of a better term, right? It was raising its funds, sending media materials all around the world, bringing recruits in from all around the world. Um, on the left, on the upper left, we have the seal of the unit with its name and its motto in both Arabic and Bosnian. Um, so Katib to Mujahideen or Older to Mujahideen. Um, and the motto, Sabilin al-Jihad, Nashput al-Jihad, our path is jihad. 
um, on the upper right, a map of Bosnia with the flag, with, of course, the, the Shahada on it as well. Um, at the same time, the Katiba, um, while it had a sort of umatic horizon, if you will, um, it chose its own, it also had a considerable autonomy. It raised its own funds, it chose its own leaders, and the leadership was almost exclusively Arab. Um, and it also had its own sort of training and da'wah and education curriculum, which was largely run along Salafi lines. Um, but the extent to which we can call this a sort of Salafi phenomenon is something that I want to leave open as a question mark and something we can discuss. Um, yet at the same time, um, this the Katiba was integrated into and fought under the leadership of the um, of the government of Bosnia Herzegovina, which was a nominally uh, non-denominational, non-religious, uh, and even non-nationalist to a certain extent um, government. So the Katiba was taking orders from generals who either uh, did not identify as Muslim, or if they did, certainly did not identify as Salafi. Um, so I think that's another uh, reason why this case is particularly interesting for revisiting some of the assumptions in debates around uh, what's called jihadism. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is that in the lower right hand uh, part of the slide, this is um, this is uh, the seal of the unit in its internal army correspondence, and it has the 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 unit's postal code number within the army postal service, but it also has the coat of arms of the of the sort of um, medieval kingdom of Bosnia-Herzegovina, right? So it's grounding itself in both kind of national imaginaries as well as nomadic horizons at the same time. Um, so uh, much of the first half of the book tries to understand how Muslims from radically different geographies and backgrounds nonetheless managed uh, questions of difference in the context of organizing a kind of armed fighting force. Um, so uh, one of the issues that that I looked at were um, debates over burial practices, right, between like Salafi headstones that are supposed to be um, uh, or rather, headstones that are understood to be Salafi in the Bosnian context. That's probably a better way of putting it. Um, so you, this is a, a Ayman. He's a Syrian who fought in the Bosnian Jihad. And we visited a cemetery for uh, foreign Mujahideen in Livade in northeastern Bosnia. Um, and uh, he's standing next to a sort of monument in the cemetery. And I'm going to zoom into it here, where on the left-hand side, uh, there is a message that essentially um, extols the umatic solidarity of the Bosnian Jihad, right? It talks about um, sort of Muslims who came from various parts of the world uh, who, let me just see this here, yes, who who left their families behind and to help uh, people who were being killed, women who were being raped, and that they accepted um, uh, um, an award from, from God that is higher, of course, than any sort of dunyawi award. And uh, zooming in further on this monument um, is this really interesting map, right, um, that happens to be uh, engraved in English for some reason. And the arrows on it kind of uh, summon this idea of an nomadic convergence, right? Of Muslims rising up from all different parts of the world to to uh, to, to 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 join their their brethren in Bosnia, um, and part of what's interesting about this way the map is configured is that it also um, has or or it resonates with a kind of nationalist imaginary as well. So on the right hand side, this is a graphic from the Washington Post. And there's many, many graphics that are like this that tries to um, unpack the phenomenon of so-called foreign fighters going to Syria. And again, you have this idea of um, people kind of converging from different nation states um, onto a particular point of origin. And then there's another graphic that shows foreign fighters leaving Syria and kind of returning to their countries of origin to wreak all sorts of different kinds of havoc. Now, I don't want to create a false equivalence, but I think what is interesting is that um, an underlying nationalist imaginary is kind of at work, even for many of the people involved in the kind of nomadic solidarity of the Bosnian Jihad. Um, so I want us to really reckon with and think with the persistence of the nation state as a category. Um, so again, the security state perspective, because it has a kind of national framing, one of the ways in which they approach this is to say, okay, these people are foreign fighters. Again, we've already baked in 
kind of the nation state as a category when we start talking about foreign fighters. And our next question is, what countries do they come from? Uh, you know, how many countries, how many fighters per capita are coming from each nation state? What are the variables in those nation states that explain that, right? Like that's sort of the way those discussions tend to go. Um, I, in talking to people and in doing archival research, I found, of course, that many of those who were fighting in Bosnia were already diasporic, right? So this, it, the, the, the way that the security studies discourse kind of uh, sets up the puzzle is sort of like, why would a country, why would a person from country A travel and risk their life and fight in country B? Um, that they must be crazy, right? Or if you want to take the more sort of positive spin on it, they must be heroic, right? They must be above and beyond any kind of worldly motivations. Um, but in both aspects, what's assumed is that the normal or natural way to engage in political violence is to do it in the service of a national army. Um, and the foreign fighter phenomenon, you know, indexes this like underlying assumption and underlying anxiety over why are people doing this outside of a nation state, right? Because let's be clear, like the largest and most dangerous group of foreign fighters in a place like Iraq, for example, are not people coming in the service of jihad. It's, of course, the United States military, right? But the category of foreign fighter is never sort of applied in that way, right? The U.S. military are international forces or coalition forces or allied forces. Um, and this gets to another part of the argument around, you know, how does the category of universalism work in practice? Um, so that being said, uh, in order to get away from kind of the nation state framing, um, I just try to talk to people and get into their life histories. Um, this is a, an interesting example. Uh, this is Abu Abdulaziz. He's kind of the protagonist, if, if you will, of the first chapter of the book. And uh, he's one of the first um, Arabs to arrive in Bosnia during the war. And he's a little bit, you know, in, in many solidarity organizing contexts, folks might have encountered like the person who likes to... Uh, get their picture taken and take a lot of credit for things, right? So Abu Abdulaziz is sort of like that guy for the Bosnian Jihad. And uh, so he he only stayed in Bosnia for a few months at the beginning, but he gave a ton of interviews. So this photograph, the color one, appeared in Newsweek, um, but he also gave interviews to uh, Ashark al Ausalt in London, that's the one on the left, uh, to the Croatian magazine Globus, uh, which is on the right. And um, in, in all of these media accounts, you know, people ask him where he's from, and he says, uh, my nationality is Islam, right? So he's kind of conjuring Islam as a nationality in this moment, which is interesting, and I think there's a lot we can unpack there. Um, but he also makes it known that he holds a, a Saudi passport. So in a way, um, he very readily kind of gets picked up as representing uh, a particular idea of, of Wahhabism or Salafism as this sort of petro-funded export from Saudi Arabia that's going around and wreaking havoc all throughout the world. Um, so the thing that's interesting about Abu Abdulaziz is that to call him a Saudi is, uh, it misses a few things. So he was actually born in the princely state of Hyderabad in southern India. Um, and for those who are not familiar with kind of this history, he's, he's from... Um, his family is from Hadramaut in southern Yemen. Um, and here I'm kind of uh, influenced by um, one of my teachers, Eng Seng Ho, who has written um, extensively on the, the Hadrami diaspora, which of course has a very deep and wide ranging diasporic presence throughout the Indian Ocean and in other areas. Um, so Hyderabad was nominally independent, but kind of under British um, suzerainty. And uh, the Hyderabadi, um, uh, well, the Nizam of Hyderabad, the ruler, uh, employed a great many um, Hadrami Arabs uh, in his army and police forces. Um, and actually, when India uh, forcibly annexed Hyderabad in 1950, the the leader of the of the Hyderabadi army who surrendered India was actually a Hadrami general himself. So Abu Abdulaziz, his uh, grandfather migrates from Hadramaut to Hyderabad in the early 20th century, and he grows up speaking Urdu, Arabic, and English as his first languages. He kind of grows up in a sort of cosmopolitan Muslim sort of context. And a few years after India takes over Hyderabad, the family moves to the, they relocate to the Hejaz. And uh, he happens to be in, in, in the Hejaz at a time when, when Arabs, some Arabs could obtain Saudi passports. Um, and he spent his career as a clerk in Saudi Airlines. And um, uh, through that work, he also manages to kind of travel the world. Um, so when he he takes early retirement in the 1980s, 
Um, and he travels to Afghanistan and participates in the jihad there. Although um, he basically, oh, I, I see there's a, a message in the chat about, yeah, Ahmed Aydarus. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Aydarus family is a really important example of this. But what's also interesting, the Aydarus, they're, they're a Sayyid family, right? So uh, Abu Abdul Aziz is from, a, is from a tribal family. So there's other kind of class and hierarchy dynamics that we can get into later. Um, but anyway, Abu Abdul Aziz, he, he's in Afghanistan briefly. I think he spent one night at the front, but he came very interested in supporting um, various uh, forms of, of jihad kind of based organizing. He's an early sponsor of the group that later becomes known as uh, lashkar e taiba in Pakistan. Um, anyway, there's, there's a lot to say about him, very interesting history. But suffice to say, um, if you understand him not as a national citizen, in that box, but rather as a diasporic subject, right? Then his genealogy and his personal history um, gives you a different pathway to thinking about transnational jihad mobilizations, right? Like it's not a coincidence that a person like this is one of the early movers and influential figures of jihad mobilization in Bosnia, right? Precisely because of the, the diasporic and migratory range of his personal history and family history, uh, the cultural competence, for lack of a better term, of his work and his upbringing um, also are, are very important in kind of how he navigates the jihad and how he conjures a kind of um, umatic project. Um, so similarly, a lot of the folks who fought in Bosnia were, as I said, they were already diasporic. Um, um, many of them were migrant workers from North Africa who were in Italy um, or in other Western European countries. Uh, all of the leaders of the Kativa um, were, uh, were Arabs who were already residing in other parts of Europe, right? None of them came directly from, from the Middle East. Um, so having a sense of the, all of these sort of diasporic entailments also helps us reconfigure some of the geographies of blame that tend to um, impede a lot of the public discourses and even the scholarly discourses around jihadism, right? Um, so anyway, I just want to sort of float that as an as an as a alternative social imaginary for thinking about how omatic mobilizations, you know, may or may not kind of unfold. Um, I think that's basic. Well, I guess just very quickly, um, uh, as I said, the, the rest of the, the first half of the book really dives into issues around kinship, around around the cultivation of virtues or akhlaq, um, and the way that other disputes are sort of uh, dealt with in the Katiba. I also want to return to the idea of um, UN peacekeeping, right? So the other major kind of armed intervention in Bosnia. Um, you know, UN peacekeeping, it's easy to gloss it as a kind of Western liberal project, but the UN peacekeeping force in Bosnia was about one third Muslim. Um, and this slide here is a monument uh, for the uh, 17th Punjab Regiment, which actually served in Tuzla uh, in northern Bosnia. Um, and so there's a, there's a colonial history here of the Pakistani army and the Indian army and their kind of uh, origins in kind of the East India uh, company formations. But also, you know, in my own conversations with officers uh, from 17th Punjab who served in Bosnia, you know, for them, it's very clear that uh, going to Bosnia with the UN um, was also a way of, um, of, of conjuring the Ummah. Um, so they, fit, they had a very, very clear sense of solidarity with fellow Muslims in mind, even as at the same time, they saw themselves as, you know, upstanding members of kind of the UN system, the so-called international community, you know, uh, working out values such as neutrality and so on. Um, and then just to take this kind of connection one step further, we have this gentleman, Abdul Manaf Kusmuri, uh, a Malaysian um, lieutenant colonel graduate of Sandhurst who went to Bosnia with the UN peacekeeping force because he wanted to help Muslims. And so his, I, you know, he had a particular omatic conjuring, if you will, um, but he also became disillusioned at what the UN was doing in Bosnia. So he quit and he joined the jihad and ended up uh, being one of the key planners for, for some of their most significant uh, military operations towards the end of the war. Um, okay, I think I've, I've spoken a bit too long, so I'll just stop there, um, and that will, you know, give us a bit more time for for some back and forth. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee. You didn't go over time at all, perfectly within time, but um, we can definitely come back to some of those points that you've raised in the in the Q and A. Uh, for now, we'll hand over to our respondent for today, uh, Dr. Basip, whenever you're ready. All right, thank you so much. Um, how's my audio? Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes all we right. can hear you. 
Um, so yeah, so I, I want to thank uh, Osman and the Omatics Colloquium also for inviting me back as a respondent and to Daryl as well for his uh, kind engagement with my work. We've been brainstorming uh, different forums to be in conversation and so I'm, I'm very glad to be here today. And thanks to him also for his book, which I was eagerly anticipating while writing my dissertation and it was published soon after I finished. And so now as I work on my uh, manuscript revisions, I continue to think especially about its methodological provocations, which is um, mostly what I'll be focusing on in my comments now. Um, because beyond his, his compelling critique of existing studies of jihad, studies which range from the utterly uh, banal to the thoroughly bankrupt and granting the intellectual poverty and corruption of security studies frameworks, I entirely agree that there's a real need for uh, developing more adequate terms and concepts for thinking Islamic politics um, in general. And so that methodological angle is one of the uh, continuing provocations of the book for me. And so that moves, I think, our discussion a little bit into something of a speculative mode of testing concepts and trying to gain traction on competing universalisms without flattening the, the differences among them as well. So um, just briefly, again, much of this uh, he just noted, but after the an introduction that lays out the terms and stakes of the project, then come four chapters on the jihad in Bosnia, respectively titled Migrations, Locations, Authorities, and Groundings. And so these thematic chapters investigate the overlapping practices of jihad in Bosnia, but also offer a model for how to approach it as a universalist project. Um, and then comes an interlude, which explores a very interesting historical episode, a prisoner exchange in 1993, which I'll come back to. And then finally come three chapters on what he calls other universalisms. So non-alignment, um, peacekeeping, and the global war on terror. And so each of these other universalisms, like the jihad, and in ways that sometimes overlap with and sometimes depart from, the jihad also works to process and manage difference as a space of remaking racial, ethnic, national, and other forms of difference. And all of that is set against a common history of empire and diaspora. So um, among these different topics, ethnography becomes a privileged method for inquiring into the overlaps, the frictions, the asymmetries between universalisms, because time and again in the book, as we just saw in the uh, kind of the, the snapshots of different people's lives, were shown how individuals pass among and through different universalist projects, be it by affiliation or interpolation. So the span of a single life shows the unexpected ways that universalisms inflect one another and how some of the boundaries that are hard in theory end up being quite porous in practice. So just as we just ended with the example of the Muslim peacekeepers in Bosnia, um, for whom the, the neutrality of their mission was not opposed to their sympathy with their fellow Muslims. Um, the book also notes how non-alignment gave Muslim elites a way of identifying with both the socialist state and the ummah at once and so on. Some of the security studies literature talks about how Islam incites transnational attachments, uh, which are condensed into the figures of the militant, the medic, and the fighter. And the book shows that these figures are not mutually exclusive. People uh, take up different roles at different parts of their lives. But it also shows that neither can any of the universalist idioms alone account on their own for the tangled biographies of Lee's interlocutors because of the historical complexity of the Bosnian Jihad and because universalist efforts to manage difference all meet their limit in history. But it's not just that universalism is interrupted by history. Rather, this interruption itself is figured differently across and within these universalist practices. And so what I find uh, very interesting is thinking about how different universalisms reckon with which differences remain unassimilable. So one of the uh, key methodological points of the book is that universalism is a, is, a, is a project of managing differences, but these differences are not all manageable in the same way according to the terms of that universalism. And so um, what happens when a certain universalist project runs into the limit of its own terms. Um, 
and so that's partly what I tried to do in some of my work, as as Daryl mentioned in his pre-circulated paper, um, in trying to understand how the present absence of the Ummah at humanitarian sites in the shadow of the war in Syria is figured so differently. And so my interlocutors inherit the sensibilities of Muslim unity, their fellow feeling, as in the famous hadith, leaving them aching with sleeplessness and fever when one limb suffers. This is after the vigorous projects of pan-Islamism in the early 20th century and after the divergent confessions of post-Islamism in the late 20th century. And my interlocutors agree that the ummah is not flourishing, that it's absent the form of sovereignty proper to it. Um, but then I, I, I wonder if it's more productive to revisit the affective figures of pain and loss through which that fellow feeling is articulated. So the ummah there appears in the form of its loss and disappearance is one mode of its appearance. Um, I want to go back to something else he noted in his pre-circulated remarks when he said that the, when he observed that the ummah is never an actor in the literature of the jihad in Bosnia. He writes, the ummah is not the one engaged in competition or conflict. Sons of the ummah may be exhorted to act, but the ummah remains above all this. And that's because the ummah is not an actor in global politics, as is, for example, the international community. He writes that since the Cold War, the international community has crystallized as an actor that can be invoked in various sectors of development and relief and human rights, but the ummah is not invoked as an actor in the same way. And so, um, and yet then he, he goes on to note that the international community um, is, it does bear a certain kind of kinship to the ummah. He says that this is akin to how the jihad referenced the ummah as its horizon of belonging. And so um, one thing I'm, I'm left with is thinking about that kinship, uh, the, the forms of that kinship, uh, because the, the contrast or comparison between the international community, which is composed of sovereign nation states and the ummah is still something we're trying to parse. And so we end up trapped between uh, theology and geopolitics or between ummatic aspirations and different instrumentalizations of the ummah. Um, and so much in the same way, which, which, as in, uh, uh, the book does this far, far, far better than this, but it, uh, among other, sectors, maybe among certain historians and political scientists, people have argued that the language of Ummah has been entirely transformed by the secular grammar of the nation state. And so Ummah has been recoded to align with modern categories of nation or society. And so when people think of the Ummah, they think of it as an actor, right? They think of it as a nation, just like other nations. Um, and so here again, ethnography can help us out, I think, because um, Muslim articulations of the Ummah always occur in dialogue and argument and contestation, and what Talal Asad calls part of a discursive tradition, right? Where even though one begins by investigating the present, the present does not enclose uh, the space of debate. And so the present is not simply the empty ground for staging a progression from past to future. And so even though the grammar of the nation state may have conscripted the language of Ummah in our secular age, we also need to pay attention to, um, to, to different kinds of friction in the ways that language is used. And so even though social scientists and security studies might observe that the Ummah is a, an imagined community like the nation or like the kind of a international community, um, Asad goes on to say that the crucial point is not that it's imagined, but that what is imagined predicates distinctive modes of being and acting. And I, I, I quote this line from him every, every time I talk about the Ummah. So we, we could maybe lean into the insight of the security state, maybe to take seriously the Ummah as what interrupts the logic of the nation. Uh, and then we could maybe think about it along, along some more kind of speculative or interesting lines. Um, but I'll set that aside for now. Uh, just to note that his book already helped us out of the, this thicket a little bit, because in the introduction, he gives us a set of terms for reading across universalisms. These analytic terms, he says, of course, certainly we should look at the idiom of a universalist project, idiom being a loose set of ideals directed at all of humanity, um, which is all too often the beginning and the end of analysis. But also we should look at the horizon of belonging of that project. Um, 
horizon of belonging being what he had called the Ummah, a category which includes some people and holds out others as capable of incorporation. Um, Universalist projects also have concrete mechanisms to process social differences. They have uh, institutional formations often that can make their discourse in the name of the universal more effective. And so these terms are helpful, not just for reading across the universalist projects he tells us about, of jihad, of peacekeeping, the war on terror, but also for comparing different versions of them as well. So comparing different, uh, different jihads, for instance. Um, I, I'm, I'm noticing I'm coming up in time. So I'll, I'll end these initial comments, I guess, by remarking on the limits of comparison as well. And the book is good about this. It says that comparison is only one means of working across different universalist projects because there are structural differences across them that defy neat contrasts or comparisons. So these structural differences mean that universalist projects are asymmetrical to each other. There's, there, there may be no common unit or a scale of analysis and maybe uh, apples and oranges, but even so people move among them. More interestingly yet, at, at specific historical junctures, these universalist projects are commensurated. And so I'm thinking again of the interlude of the book, um, when the Mujahids forced the international community to negotiate with them. He says, humanity's representatives and humanity's enemies ostensible enemies, shared a stage and shook hands, a scene of dialogue made possible through violence. So the importance of this exchange lies in the parity it implies, a recognition across difference in spite of itself. Despite the asymmetry of their struggles, and despite the fact that they did not share sources of authority or legitimacy, the prisoner exchange implies an equivalence, or I would say at least, at least a commensuration, between the things or the people being traded. And he notes that from the perspective of the Mujahids, the exchange was part of their ongoing relationships with non-Muslims. That was an, under, an, an understanding that was not then uh, reciprocated. But it's this kind of commensuration across difference, which I find most provocative to think about as a, um, in part because of how it resonates with other efforts to think across competing universalities. Judith Butler ends her chapter of that name, Competing Universalities, in her book written with Zizek and Leclau by offering translation as a way of thinking about the relationship between particular and universal. So Lee writes that every universalist project bears the inherent tensions of having to incarnate values held out to all mankind, but that also have a particular provenance. So it's a question of particular and universal. Butler writes that critical translation between competing universalist projects will not be in the terms of a single meta language. There's no single language that will rule them all or that we can discover to mediate perfectly between everything. Rather, she seeks the movement between languages as a way of opening up versions of universality that shatter the existing norms of dominance and their claims to universality. So she's working in the field of political philosophy, of course, not anthropology, not Islamic studies, but it seems to me that there's a moment in the prisoner exchange this kind of recognition despite itself and elsewhere in the book as well. So it, um, the, the, the image in the global war and terror chapter, uh, which in which um, uh, the, the interlocutor is seeking a different relationship between ummah and nation. There are moments like this across the book that resonate with how Butler describes the equivocation between competing universalities. And so um, it's, it's that kind of, of uh, searching maybe a, a kind of across differences not for a single language to translate perfectly between competing universalities, but to think across them and with their asymmetries that I think some of the ethnographic scenes in the book uh, also disclose. Um, and then maybe I just as a, as a final comment or a question, I, I wanted to observe also that there seems to have been a, a remarkable interest in this book also among certain sectors of Anglophone and Muslim public discourse as evidenced also by our current discussion. And so I wanted to ask whether uh, whether Daryl or Oemir or others in fact had thoughts about that as well. Um, because certainly, you know, it, it speaks to the need for more complex engagements with jihad. And so the sense that the, the book comes as a, as a breath of fresh air, you know, to those accustomed to the miasma of other uh, discourse on it. But I wonder if there's more to be said about such readings and, and, um, and the, need, the need for them as well. All right, I'll, I'll leave it there. We can come back to things later on too, but uh, thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Basit. Um, inshallah, we hope to hear from you as well in the discussion uh, and in the Q&A session. Uh, a note on that, just before we do come back to you, Dr. Lee, to, if, you, if you'd like to respond to Dr. Basit there. But I see that a couple of people have got their hands up or interested in asking questions. A reminder that you can submit your questions in writing in the Q&A box, or you will be able to have the chance to raise your hand and speak directly. So just while people start thinking about their questions and comments, um, Dr. Lee, we'll come back to you if you want to uh, respond to some of Dr. Bassett's thoughts there. Yeah, thank you so much, Bassett. There, uh, that was incredibly rich. Um, I'll just try to respond quickly to a few of the things that jumped out most prominently to me. Um, so I appreciate your exhortation. Um, so I think the, the unspoken kind of subtext of the dialogue is that, you know, yes, there's a rejection of security studies, but um, that can't be, uh, you know, that can't be where the analysis ends. That has to be the starting point. And often, you know, this is just one of the problems of the distortionary gravitational field of, of living under imperial conditions, right? So um, I think, but it's not simply that we need to have an alternative you know, kind of articulation of how we want to understand and 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 talk about these things, but I I appreciate your exhortation actually to lean into the fear, right? The fear that the security discourse has of the ummah as this thing that, you know, as the excess that nation state loyalties can't fully capture. You know, we so often, I mean, I use we in like the broadest possible, you know, most problematic way possible, but um, that the so much of the of the of the critical discourse. Um, I think has been responding from a place of fear. And, you know, it's, you know, this is where like the sort of, you know, not all Muslims are violent sort of thing comes from. And, you know, there's something to be said about saying, well, you know, there, there is a, there is a thing here that they're afraid of. And of course, you know, the way in which they're afraid of it and their imagining of it is deeply flawed. But the fact that it is unsettling, if not threatening, is something that's actually worth taking seriously. Um, so I think, um, you know, Leaning, leaning into fear is good. Um, so, you know, you heard it first from Bostic Law um, at the Omeotics Colloquium. A um, couple of other quick things. Um, I really appreciate the provocation about uh, Ummah and Ummah versus international community. Um, the observation of Ummah as, as not acting is really a thing that kind of just occurred to me as I was trying to write the comments for this particular audience. And it's, it's, and it's based on, you know, the materials that I have seen. Um, but I'm not, um, I'm not so sure how widely applicable it is, right? And I think your point is very well taken that there is, uh, there is a, a robust conversation that does think of Ummah as actor, right? And um, you know, if you want to just take, if you want to continue down the sort of IR route, right? Like, is the OIC the Ummah? I mean, maybe there are some people who think of it that. I mean, maybe the OIC. You know, maybe the OIC has a relationship to the category category of Ummah that maybe is analogous to the relationship that the UN as an organization has to the international community. But I think the effectiveness of the performance is probably quite different. I mean, it's it's extremely fraught even for the UN, but I think for the OIC and given all of the sort of um uh sort of well, all of the politics that you write about so wonderfully, as well as many others, I think there's there's just a lot to unpack there. Um, so I, that's something that I would love to continue to think about with with you. Um, uh, in terms of this, in terms of the your your wonderful observations about method and commensurability and translation, um, I I like translation because of its, for lack of a better term, like lateral character, right? Because there's no independent basis upon which, I mean, the idea of like linguistic hierarchy, I think has long been debunked, right? So when we talk about translation, we just have two languages and there's no claim about superiority and complexity or things like that, right? Translation kind of forces that, it's that leveling move that's that's sort of like what the prisoner exchange is about. Um, I also want to throw diglossia into the mix um, because for me, the, the diglossia, um, in Arabic, right? So like fusha versus dialects for those who aren't familiar with the term um, is also a kind of uh, unstated linguistic model for thinking about universalism that's in the book, but doesn't get well brought out. It's there, there's like allusions to it here and there. Um, and diglossia is kind of vertical, right? Um, so I'm I'm wondering if, 
we need a diglossic perspective alongside a translational perspective at different points in our analysis, right? When we're trying to highlight different angles. Um, so that's just like my off the cuff reaction to that to that great observation of yours. Um, the last thing is actually, I really just wanted to hear more from you about tribulation because I think you've been doing really fascinating work with this concept as well. And I think it, you know, goes many places where my analysis doesn't in ways that I think are really productive. Um, so I, I'm just, you know, I would really love to hear more about that um, maybe now or as part of the Q&A or, or whatever, but I don't, want, I don't want that to get kind of lost in the shuffle. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Lee. We'll definitely come back to that query, I think, in, in, in the conversation. Um, but for now, we'll open up the, the, the floor to our audience. Uh, a reminder that obviously panelists, you can just raise your hand and you'll be able to unmute yourself directly and pose your question. Uh, our public audience, you can raise your hand and you'll be uh, given the microphone um, via the administrator. So you can also ask your question directly, or if you prefer, you can submit it in the Q&A box. We have a couple of um, question, hands raised already. So we'll start actually with brother Ashraf, Ashraf Dokrat, who I think was first. Uh, so if should be allowed to speak now, brother Ashraf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I trust that you can hear me from South Africa, Pretoria, South Africa. Um, <clears throat> I was very happy that uh, Brother uh, Basit uh, actually raised the issue of uh, Talal Asad and uh, his work on, on the subject. Um, and in light of what uh, Daryl um, has presented here this evening, uh, we speak about you know, um, the universalisms and, and the universalisms, universalisms that belong to the Ummah. Um, but what about the universalisms of the other? In other words, what about their universalisms. And, um, you know, for me, the work of Talal Asad, especially his 2010 article, um, Thinking About Terrorism and Just War, uh, raises some of those issues on uh, the universalisms that actually uh, feed into uh, the others' uh, uh, thinking and, 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 and their ideas about what constitutes just war and what constitutes uh, terror, what constitutes uh, torture, et cetera. Uh, so I was just wondering if, if Daryl has given this some thought and also if Basit can share some ideas about that. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Lee, and then we'll come to Dr. Basit, inshallah. Oh, so you want, me to, you want us to answer them rather than to group them? Yeah, I think let's... We'll go with each question because oftentimes people have multiple different topics. Other people want to respond to those comments. Um, we'll try and keep it topic focused. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, Ashraf, thank you so much for your question. And the short answer is uh, yes, I have thought about it. And I actually um, cite that very article that I said in the book. Um, and the the I guess my basic response is um, people have done a lot of thinking about the universalism of the other, right, or universalisms of the other, and I think the critiques that Asad makes are 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 absolutely compelling and as relevant and as important as they have ever been. Um, where I feel like what what I was trying to do with the book in terms of adding to the conversation was to ask, okay, Asad and others have told us how um, violent and exclusionary and problematic uh, these projects are, right, especially in that article. Um, but how does that help us understand what uh, the folks I'm writing about are doing in the jihad context? And um, I said it has made a few references here and there. Uh, and it's it's a bit, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I kind of get the sense that um, that the critique is sort of to say, well, terrorists so-called, and, and he does use the term, you know, they're 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 modern and ruthless and violent um, in a way that's no different from the states that 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 claim to be fighting them. And um, I think that's both um, true, but also kind of insufficient as a basis for building an alternative account. Um, and that's exactly the gap that I'm I'm trying to uh, to address with this book. Um, I I think there's there's also this really interesting. Um, tension between the earlier parts of Assad's uh, body of work and the more recent turn in the anthropology of secularism that uh, 
that are also kind of overshadowing the conversation um, because there are, you know, there are particular ways of reading or maybe misreading Asad that could actually, that are not entirely opposed to some of the security state discourses, right, that we're opposing, right? So I think a really good example of this is the recent book by um, uh, Nathan French called And God Knows the Martyrs, um, which is actually, I think, like a very good book in the context of these debates around like what is terrorism and what is jihadism and so on. But I think it also, uh, and, it, and it tries to take Assad seriously, but in a way it still ends up being kind of, um, uh, it, it still doesn't get beyond the trap of like a particular way of thinking about doctrinal Islam. So um, I don't think we should hold Assad responsible for that, but I think it's interesting to say, okay, like which Assad are we invoking for which parts of this argument and which parts of this conversation and being conscious. I think, I mean, I haven't talked to him about it personally, but I, I, I often wonder if there's a part of him that even saw the way that could go. And then sort of that had something to do with the turn that he took in the nineties in terms of interrogating secularism more directly. Um, but yeah, I think you're the, the, the question that you're raising is exactly um, uh, the set of circumstances that, that I'm trying to, to understand and to respond to. Dr. Vasit, would you like to come in? And then we'll go to Dr. Mujib to comment on that. Um, sure. Um, I would just say that that that, that um, there's that article certainly on on just war and terrorism. The 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 one by him that I find you know still very uh, difficult to work through and and uh, is the 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 one from 2015 on re reflections on on violence law and humanitarianism and critical inquiry because there he's not only kind of giving this genealogy of how violence get, gets wrapped up right with this uh, you know this history of european benevolence and and the the claim of um that kind of benevolent uh, imperial action as being universal um, but also at how different different modes of violence get wrapped up into that gesture as well, and um, and, and still maybe inflect kind of humanitarianism as a global discourse of moral reason today. And so um, I find that article kind of a very helpful bridge between some of the discussions on um on 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 jihad and war and the differences or similarities or you know that whole discourse on the one hand and the the discourse on humanitarianism and humanitarian intervention um and this is going back to again some of that security study stuff on how umma uh, uh sentiments they produce people who either incline toward militancy or toward humanitarian action, right? These are the two kind of impulses that people are are, are drawn to, um, and so this article by Asad gives a kind of a, a mirror, uh, a, a kind of a, a a a mirror genealogy, right, to how uh, violence and law and humanitarianism get produced in this particular way uh, in the West. But anyway, I'll I'll, I'll leave it there. Um. Dr. Majib, did you want to come in on, on that point just before we go to another question? Oh, I'm afraid you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on a more general topic on the issue of universalisms and uh, legitimation crises and how Bosnia was so central to that um, and still is. I think it's playing out very much um, in terms of relations between the Muslim world and the West more generally. And so I thank um, Professor Lee for really a, a, an invaluable contribution um, in this regard. Um, and I think um, I don't uh, uh, I don't know if you I'll, I'll look at, uh, in my own writing, you know, I, I I should mention I was involved um, in a lot of the issues you were discussing in terms of um, mobilizing for Bosnia and so on. Um, in um, with a colleague of mine, Hakan Yavuz, uh, at the very beginning of the Bosnian uh, genocide, both in the United States as well as um, in Turkey and the Middle East. 
Um, so I saw a lot of this on the ground, um, what you were talking about. It certainly had a huge impact in Turkey. Um, and um, Yavuz, my colleague uh, Hakan Yavuz writes about it in his recent book on neo-Ottomanism. Uh, Bosnia was central in um, discrediting Kemalism in Turkey, um, not just among the public, but among the counter elite that um, formed from Refah to what is today AKP. And um, I saw it at the time I was in Turkey too, um, with um, Abdullah Gul and uh, Ahmed Davutoglu and um, and um, uh, Bulent Arash and so on, who uh, who were MPs uh, at the time and were not in power. Uh, it was you know Tansu Chiller and uh, uh, after Ozal, but it affected Ozal very much too. And Yavuz writes about this, um, um, but uh, you know in my own writing. Uh, uh, in a volume that he and Peter Sluglet had written, I traced this uh, to uh, to the pr sort of inherent contradictions in this attempt at universalism, which is the very beginnings of humanitarian interventionism uh, uh, connected to the intervention in Greece in 1821, um, and on the on the basis that you know the the, uh, uh, the Ottoman attempt to suppress the uprising there. Um, um, challenge universal values and, and brought together a coalition. Now, Gary Bass, you know, in Freedom's Battle, writes that this is the beginning of sort of human rights discourse and 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 um, humanitarian interventionism. But in my own critique of Bass, I point out that um, the interventions um, were actually particularistic. They were inevitably geared towards um, Christian minorities in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but where Muslims were the victims of ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, Crimea, and the Caucasus, there was no such rallying. Um, it was you know, largely ignored, or often you had Western powers that were complicit in it. And uh, but the assumption was, you know, um, this changes right in the modern world. This is what Gary Bass is arguing. Um, but um, I think Bosnia showed that it didn't. And that was the shocking thing of it. Um, if if you read. Um, Taylor Branch's book, you know, he has an account of how um, the, uh, uh, at the highest levels, government of John Major and also Francois Mitterrand, they were telling Bill Clinton that uh, they supported the Serbs because the Bosnians were, quote, an alien presence in Europe and, um, and Bosnia could emerge as a kind of threat. And um, this was, of course, one of the most secular populations in the world uh, at the time, the Bos Bosniak Muslim population, but which also was the only one to actually uphold the ostensibly universal values of, of you know, pluralism, of democracy, of secularism, and and um, they were the ones who had abjured that kind of um, ultra nationalism. Um, um, so I think that you know that legitimation crisis really has we're living with it today. I don't think we've transcended. We look at the double standards about Syria versus Ukraine and so on that's being discussed. Um, so I, I don't know if you. I guess my uh, question was if you tie in the 19th century origins and, and, and failures of universalism even in our own time, though it's been contested and. Um, you know, and there have been sincere attempts at addressing it, but, you know, it's quite, quite obviously fallen short. Um, and then I guess my final last point was um, this, uh, you did mention about Africa, for example, and I do recall at the time, um, Boutros Ghali mentioning that um, there are a number of places that are worse off. Um, and then, of course, you had the Rwandan genocides where some 800,000 people were killed in a matter of three months. Um, but uh, I don't know if you're aware, there's a direct link uh, with the Rwandan genocide in Bosnia, which is that um, Colin Powell is on record as saying, the reason we intervened in Somalia was we, do, we don't do mountains, we do deserts. And he said we were under a lot of pressure after the New World Order was announced in Iraq uh, that we were ignoring genocide in Bosnia. So as a way of showing the Muslim world that, um, you know, that we're not completely indifferent to their suffering, they had no in interest in intervening in Bosnia, of course, but they were going to intervene in Somalia. But uh, it wasn't taken seriously as a mission, uh, of course, and then you had Black Hawk down and so on. So it was kind of stage managed with the Marines landing on the beach, beaches and so on. But then they, they the mission creep led to the uh, Black Hawk Down ambush. And then that directly led uh, to Clinton 
uh, insisting nothing would be done about Rwanda, that he couldn't afford another such Samal Mogadishu type event. So even though, as Romeo Dallaire said, even a small intervention, a few hundred troops could have stopped the Interhamwe killers, uh, uh, Clinton insisted there would be no intervention and made sure no one else would intervene either. And uh, tragic... you leave, sorry, if you could just wrap up with your question. So yeah, that, that was, that was yes. I'm sorry to be yeah. long-winded, but yeah, those are, those are my two points. If you could maybe talk about the 19th century origins and then the failures today and yeah. Okay. We have a few more hands raised, but if you just want to comment on that uh, quickly, Dr. Lee. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. That was that was an incredible uh, uh, throwback to the 90s. And I just I, I had all the 90s feels. Um, so just very quickly, I think um, what's important, because I think the story about uh, humanity, first of all, all universalisms are are um, at some level prone to hypocrisy and failure and abuse. And that's really one of the main points. So I, I'm, you know, I'm really trying to get us away from the idea of like, when is universalism genuine or successful or or pretextual? Um, I think that, you know, because when we talk about like humanitarian intervention discourse emanating from the West, for example, uh, as you point out, people have been have been demonstrating the hypocrisy of this ever since it started. Um, but that doesn't stop it from continuing to unfold in the way that it does, because that's actually a feature rather than a bug. Um, but just to, to historicize it a bit. Um, Yes, like this story of humanitarian intervention for so-called Christian minorities in Ottoman or former Ottoman lands, that's a very long history. Of course, it was always being instrumentalized. But the other thing that I want to draw attention to is um, that there is always uh, the geostrategic competition um, with, uh, with Russia and with other states that was going on at the same time. And you can't understand the anti-Muslim animus in this historical arc without also understanding the factors that give rise to selective and instrumentalized Islamophilia among Western elites. Um, so the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for example, when they occupied Bosnia, they were relatively sympathetic to Muslims in Bosnia, not because of any humanitarian desire or whatever, because they needed a counterweight to, to Serbia, right? And to other like newly emergent states in that sort of direction. And that kind of gets back to your point about about Somalia and and you know what happened in the 90s. So yes, there were these deeply, deeply ingrained anti-racist, uh, sorry, anti-Muslim attitudes, right, among European elites vis-a-vis -vis, um, Muslims in Bosnia. But that also had to be counterbalanced against their other kind of competing geostrategic agendas vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So I think the way to um the way that I sort of understand uh, the lowest common denominator Western policy towards Bosnia is that uh, the the closest thing to a consensus emerges around the idea that um, there needs to be enough of a, com a political community for Muslims there so as to uh, prevent the hegemony of competing powers such as Russia, um, but not strong enough to actually be a site of flourishing for for Muslims there, um, and it's that attempt to sort of split the difference, or 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 you know when it gets to fighting to bleed all sides out, as we saw in Syria, um, that I think sets up this dynamic, right? And I think it's important to understand uh, the strategic dimensions of both the anti-Muslim animus as well as the selective Islamophilia, so that folks can actually recognize what's going on and and sort of make their calculations accordingly. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Okay, let's uh, get through some more questions. Um, Brother Yahya, I think you were next. Uh, thank you to the Omatics uh, Forum, um, uh, to Dr. Dr. Lee, uh, and to Dr. Barsit uh, for, for this wonderful discussion. Um, a brief comment and a, and a very short question. Um, I I echo your point, uh, Dr. Lee, about the the paucity of understanding the impact, the historic impact of the Bosnian War uh, as a form of automatic mobilization outside of the mobile jihad. Um, uh, the, you know, there's an unwritten monograph to be written, really, about the about the, the impact of um, the, 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 did you hear my early words? Sorry, my my mic was up. Did you hear? Okay. Yeah, so the, yeah. the 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 impact of the um 
of, of the idea that um, you know the, um, Muslims ident sense of precarity in Europe. Um, you know the Bosnian genocide, the war sh demonstrated that Muslims were, you know, two things. One is had a far longer presence than most migrant populations in uh, of Muslims in Western Europe were previously aware. So they both had roots, but at the same time, those roots were were meaningless um, because they were Muslims in, but not of Europe, as as Assad says in his 2003 essay. So it's that precarity, that moment of of umatic solidarity, is combined with a sense of precarity about the place of Muslims in Europe. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a lot to be said about this moment in the formation of modern European. Muslim identities uh, in this sort of umatic moment. Um, and I, I do feel that I, I know that umatic mobilizations without a kind of political great power in the world to to back the, to back it up, if you like. Um, we perhaps you ought to think about, you know, that they, they are wide and thin mobilizations so so where, where the cause is clear enough if you know what i mean that it, it has enough resonance it can be in, still incredibly powerful um uh, even with all the competing nation states and everything and so on and so forth so that leads me that's my observation but it leads me to kind of a question to both of you um could you expand a little bit more on the potential of ummah as an analytical category not with respect to universalisms or the nation state, but with respect to diaspora. Um, you know, the, and because this is another and, and minority, so diaspora and minority, because because I think if we do that, if we 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 put it into dialogue with universalism, nation state, diaspora, and minority, then I think we begin to see the 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 distinctive analytical purchase that Ummah could have an, as an analytical category. So I invite your comments on, on that. Dr. Lee, would you like to start? And Dr. Iqbal, please do come in as well. Um, I was actually just going to kick into Bossett because I think he'd be okay. much better. No, but, I, <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm not saying that as dismissal. I think that's a it's an extremely important intervention that you're making. And it's one that I... I I didn't have space to really expand on in the book on sort of the the special meaning that that Bosnia had for for Muslims in Europe. But everything you're saying is important. And yeah, I think there's multiple monographs that need to be written about it. And the precarity is exactly um, the precarity and, and also the questions of racialization that kind of um, lurk there are are extremely important. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I think I I, I sort of yield to to Bosnia to talk about sort of you got to um, write that book. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Dr. Basel. Thank you. I, um, in terms of the the potential for um, the potential of the concept of um, one of the the uh, key, I don't know, the, the, the one of the moments that, that I often think about when I when I uh, try to work through this concept of Dhamma or different or what we need to do in order to approach this concept in the first place. I, I think back to one of my uh, first time going to the American Anthropological Association conference, and I was presenting on Umma and the difficulty of translating between particular and universal with reference to this concept. And I, um, I, I, I met someone. You know, he's like, "Oh, what's your paper about?" And I'm excited. You know, I got glad to. I I missed it, but I was hoping to, you know, hear. But and so I mentioned something about how I was trying to approach the Umma concept. And he's like, "Well." Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, we can approach the Ummah as anything other than an ideological name for a community. And I'm not sure that giving Ummah analytic weight as a concept is uh, is viable, right? We, we already know what our concepts are. And so I, I really, you know, that really rankled me and I, I you know, it was very senior uh, anthropologist and I was like, I don't, uh, anyway, so, but, but, my point is just that since that time, I've, I've been trying to see what what room there is for conceptual experimentation, um, and and one of the touchstones for that, which I'm I'm sure you are uh, uh, you're 
bit better version in it than I am, Yahya, but it's how Salman Sayyid finds in the idea of a globalized ummah, um, a, a, a form of community that can't be uh, apprehended by the, the exclusive or territorial limits of the nation, right? So it's not, uh, it's not a nation. It's not apprehended by the capital-based networks of the market. So it's not, you know, the form of economy circulation. It's not a community formed by circulation in that way, nor is it simply that of kind of the eclectic terms of a cultural civilization. And so that's where he turns to the to a notion of Muslim diaspora, not to imply that you know every Muslim is uh, displaced or every Muslim belongs to a diaspora or Muslims don't belong, uh, but specifically for how a diaspora interrupts the closure of nation, kind of what I was saying before. Um, and so there, the idea of Ummah as diaspora is an attempt to come to terms with the limits and the crisis of the nation state, but uh, in kind of an enigmatic ending to that intervention, he says that the, the inability of the ummah to fully articulate itself as universal means that it's caught in the logic of diaspora. And so there he seems to be shifting from a kind of declarative or speculative mode into a kind of a symptomatic one, where he's reading the difficulty of articulating the ummah as universal. And so uh, uh, that's one one strong reference point for me for thinking about what you were calling the potential of ummah beyond, uh, be, you know, beyond nation, beyond market, beyond civilization. Um, another one now I, I, I am realizing is um, uh, uh, Daryl's term, the kind of horizon of belonging. Um, and, and, and so I feel, I feel like these two at least give us some coordinates for thinking about this, but I, I feel like I'll, 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 I'll defer further, further discussion to later. Um, can I just quickly jump on to what yes, also definitely. Saying? Please do. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, yeah, I think your, your intervention is incredibly thoughtful and, prov and provocative. Um, my kind of off the cuff reaction is, is a question and possibly a concern about um, other forms of diaspora in which people who happen to be Muslim find themselves, right? So for example, when I think about like, um, when I think about the writings of Sherman Jackson, for example, right? Like in his work and in, in the perspective of some African-American Muslims, uh, Ummah is almost a way of overcoming the diaspora condition or repairing a wound in the diaspora condition, right? Um, and even for communities that see themselves as immigrant communities, they have a diasporic relationship to specific places, right? So um, I think one really, so for me, one of the questions is, you know, if we think of Ummah as diaspora, how is that relationship, wh what is the relationship between that and other kind of diasporic discourses and understandings that are existing. I mean, that's not like a pushback question. It's like a genuinely, like maybe Ummah's universalism, yes, yeah, sorry, Ummah as, as, as diaspora transforms other diasporic understandings as well, right? They're not necessarily counterposed to each other, but it's just something that I want to sort of, um, you know, uh, put on the table as well for further consideration. Can I just quickly, very quickly come back on that, just to say oh. that, um, I mean, I, I have, problems with Salman Sayyid's use of diaspora. Well, I mean, I think it's important that he sort of made us think about that aspect of it. But the reason why I think it's under theorized is because eth ethnically based diasporas can become omatic and they find solidarities beyond ethnicity, you know? And so the Bosnian mobilization makes no sense whatsoever if you can't describe the transition from diaspora, a diasporic mobilization and a, a nomadic one, you know, so if you use diaspora for both, I think you lose something in these transitions. So, um, you know, if you have, um, you know, we could think of all the examples where actually, uh, let's take Kashmir, Kashmir, fails to have outside of Pakistan it fails to have purchase as a, as a, as a high ranking omatic cause let's put it that way even though it's as old as Israel uh, of, uh, sorry as old as Palestine as a cause it, it doesn't have the same valence 
and and so we and, and we could all talk about why some causes remain ethnicized or within a certain regional horizon even with globalized diasporas ethnic diasporas but we don't see that with bosnia we have to ask the question why was it in that that moment it was a nomadic mobilization what what differentiates that from you know the lack of mobilization say over kashmir and the reason why i i say that is because i'm interested not just the analytical purchase of um, umma for descriptive terms, but I'm interested in a normative political theology in which we galvanize ummatic sentiment in the world and we think about how to nurture ummatic sentiment. So I'm very interested in how we nurture it from where we are now by understanding how ummatic mobilizations can work successfully without any great champion in the world of geopolitics. Um, and 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 when they don't when they don't gain purchase, even though you would have a Muslim peoples who are oppressed who are saying we need help, we need support, but nobody listens really. And in, in the Ummah, why do Ummah? Okay, I wanted to see if any of the panelists who have their hands up so far have a point directly related to that. Um, Brother Maraj, Dean, do you or and and, and Jihad does as well? Um, okay, sorry, I didn't. Perhaps not, Brother Mirajdi. Okay, Gihad, why don't you start us off? Because it's just good to have the same points together. Okay, um, yeah, thank you to everyone who spoke. This has um, been very interesting. Um, I'm just going to start off with um, the statement that um, Dr. Daryl, is it doctor? I hope I'm getting it right. <laughs> that you said um, the Ummah as, as something with which to overcome or heal the diasporic condition and, and just to, um, when you were talking about the, the makeup um, of the, the people who were fighting in, um, in Bosnia at the time, especially the Arabs filling leadership positions coming from diasporic backgrounds, um, did, uh, like, I'm, I'm asking whether this came up in, in the interviews or whether you have arrived at this, um, like, as, as you looked at, at all of the data that you, that you gathered, that uh, did the national origin um, in, in defining themselves matter more to the people who came directly from the home country or who were not diasporic. Um, and if they, if, how did they, cons um, how did they explain to themselves their minority position in relation to others who are coming from diasporic backgrounds? Um, and did, did you feel that this was just a correlation or, or that there was more going on in how the people's relationship to place affected how they imagined the ummah and, and how they relate to it. I uh, hope that made sense. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. And because you're actually putting your finger on, um, on a problem. I'm not sure if it's my problem or a problem with the category or both, but um, I should clarify that um, when I said that most of the Arab Mujahids were already diasporic, um, that is not to say that they had necessarily grown up in Europe. Um, so a lot of the key, there, there are people who fit that category, people who were born and or raised uh, in sort of majority non-Muslim contexts, um, but they're not in the leadership. Um, and, and the way that their stories are narrated is often the, what you'd expect. It's like, they they were guided, you know. They 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 found Islam properly, and you know, um, mashallah, they they were they were rescued right from the temptations of the societies in which they lived. But the leadership, they were diasporic, um, or maybe I would say they were exilic. Um, so they did grow up in the region, but they found themselves in Europe either um, as as university students, or in the case of some, as political dissidents. Um, this kind of connects to your question about. The, the enduring importance of national origin. So, you know, I, I gave you this whole presentation about thinking outside the nation state, blah, blah, blah. But of course, uh, national categories, national politics remain relevant, absolutely. And I don't want to, to give a misleading impression. Um, the most influential leaders of the Katiba were essentially um, people who were either part of or sympathetic to um, Al-Gamas Lameya in Egypt, um, which for those who are not aware was a, a sort of 
armed opposition group that was uh, fighting the Mubarak regime at that time. Um, and it was precisely because of those perceived affiliations that at some points during the war, uh, donors, especially in Kuwait, actually um, started raising questions and even temporarily interrupted funding for the Katiba. Um, so national scale politics remain absolutely relevant and important. And again, this kind of just gets back to the idea that, you know, when we talk about universalism, it's not, you know, in its when it's presented in a pejorative sense, it's often this idea of like, oh, these people, they don't believe in the nation state. They want to erase all the categories and, you know, um, flatten everything. And, you know, and that's not how any universalist project works, right? Universalism's promise transcendence of various forms of belonging, not elimination, right? The goal of any universalist project is not homogeneity, right? That's why there's no expectation in the jihad that everybody speaks Arabic, right? I mean, that's just like, yeah, we're Muslims who come from different places. How do we organize that difference, right? And that presupposes um, the preservation of that difference. Um, so yeah, national origin, national politics remain kind of absolutely relevant and important for that. It's just the question of, you know, what do we do with that, right? And so the security state framing is the like, you know, as I mentioned, you know, correlation between national origin and participation in violence, as opposed to what I'm trying to do, which is to show, yes, there are national scale politics that then inflect the solidarity organizing of the jihad, and you need to know that, but it's not reducible to all of these different nation states as like units of analysis. Okay. Um, Dr. Bassett, do you want to come in and add to any of that or we can save it for the next question? Okay, cool. We have quite a few questions now. We have just under half an hour left. So uh, if people could keep their questions concise to about two minutes, that would be helpful. We can try and get through as many as we can. Um, okay, let's go actually to uh, brother Sayyid Hamad uh, from our attendees and then we'll come back to our panelists. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, we can hear. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and a special salam to Ibrahim Bhai and Mehrajadeen Bhai. Ibrahim Bhai, I have interacted with you on Twitter a lot, and Mehrajadeen Bhai, I studied in Islamic University, and we have had small conversations around. So it's, it was really refreshing to see both of you here. So my question is really simple, actually. Uh, my question is uh, to, to Dr. Dar Dari. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask that, uh, how do you see the role of legitimization? How do you see the role of symbols, miracles, and Islamic uh, eschatology in uh, legitimization and motivation uh, for jihadi? Um, thanks for your question. Um, that's uh, that's what chapter three of the book uh, takes up quite directly. So I'm really glad you asked it. Uh, the short answer is um, there is a standard narrative that's like stories of Karabat, they're propaganda, they motivate people, they go. Um, I don't think that's entirely wrong necessarily, but the chapter tries to lay out an argument for how narratives of miracles um, can actually be understood as part of a, a different political theology and one that we can understand as matic. So um, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but it's, I mean, that, that's where I would go with that. Um, eschatology, that's actually a slightly different uh, challenge. Um, personally, in my own work on the Bosnian Jihad, I didn't find it to be the most helpful category. And my sense is that um, I don't think eschatology is irrelevant for contemporary jihad mobilizations at all, but I, I feel it's the I feel it, I think it's gotten a little bit um too much attention. Um so there's books about like jihadist apocalypticism and things like that. And you know, I'm not saying there's no there there, but I think it's very easy for that to slide into a certain kind of narrative that. Um, that doesn't hold up for a host of other reasons. So similarly, I think there's, uh, I think there's a really interesting challenge, like for a project of like how can we take eschatology seriously as a category in these kinds of mobilizations, but without recapitulating the terms in which eschatology has sometimes been kind of appropriated um, in in some of these narratives. Um, so that's you know I think that would be a great project for someone else to take up. Um, so yeah, but thank you for your question. 
Okay, great. Um, let's go to Ibrahim and then we'll take uh, a written question from the Q&A box. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks very much. It's a very interesting topic and I think you, you dealt with it very well. Um, you, you mentioned, for example, the Malaysian and the Pakistani soldiers. I think there were also Egyptians there too, if I'm not mistaken, which is ironic given the, uh, the you know, opposition in Egypt. But the thing I wanted to ask was, um, you mentioned, for example, the Pakistani soldiers who, who didn't see a, who didn't see a, you know, sort of contrast between working with the UN and working, uh, you know, sort of as a Muslim for the Umaf. And I mean, if you look at if you look at um, the Afghanistan war, for example, or even Kashmir, for example, gener generally you see sort of this overlay between, you know, the Pakistani state or some other state and um, and sort of uh, transnational sorts of things. And I mean, with Pakistan, one of the ways that the government legitimizes itself and uh, the army in particular, and I think a lot of them, like I'm, I'm not saying they, they do it cynically, but is to say that, you know, we're sort of an army of Islam or an army of jihad, and these sorts of things. And um, that's specifically focused on India, but it's not exclusively focused on India. Um, so for uh, for example, um, in the 1990s, uh, it was quite famous, basically, you had the pa Pakistan that was um, sending uh, weapons to Bosnia despite the embargo. And then when the United States found out about it, they basically forced them to switch their intelligence head and things like that. So. I think there were also there was also a small role in the Tajikistan war and the Chechnya war, for example. And of course, India and other sort of uh, rivals of Pakistan they sort of played this up, saying that this is sort of like you know a jihadi state or things like that. And you you have Sudan, you have Iran, and other sort of countries that have had this experience too. So I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think um, when we're when we're thinking of an omatic or you know sort of internationalist sort of sort of thing? Where do you what do you see the role of um, state structures, for example, militaries or intelligence or things like that, uh, uh, as, as being seen by the people who are participating. For example, what, what would like a, a fighter in Bosnia or a commander in Bosnia, what, what was their general attitude towards Muslim states that were helping or not helping? Um, was, it, was it outright hostile? Was it, was it um, you know, sort of conditional that yeah, you, well, we accept them because they're helping us or was it, you know, Sort of these are the Muslim governments, so we would like to help them. Um, and I think that's my question. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, I think the, um, I mean, obviously there is a range of reactions, but I think the most common reaction in during the war was just desperation and um, Bosnian Muslims just, you know, needing help from anywhere they could get it. And the Bosnian, uh, the, 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 the ruling sort of, um, you know, the people involved in Sarajevo and the SDA, I mean, they were very keen to cultivate allies from wherever they could, right? So they were invoking pan-Islamic solidarity on the one hand, but they were also uh, lobbying with Zionists in the United States on the other hand, right? And I don't really blame them for that. You know, they, they had to do what they had to do. So, um, uh, and yeah, just you know, the thing with 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 Pakistan is interesting. Of course, I mean, for for people who of a, of a certain age, you know, they might recall the television series Alpha Alpha Brava Charlie, which was sponsored by um, ISPR, and actually, you know, told the story about Pakistanis going to Bosnia and stuff. So, yes, absolutely, the Pakistani state uh, has invested a lot in this kind of narrative. But if you look at the concrete investments of the Pakistani military abroad. You know, more often than not, it's UN peacekeeping and sending troops to the Saudis and the Qataris and the Americans, right, to help them. So I think, you know, and and in a way that makes the invocation of jihad and and omatic concerns probably all the more important, right? Precisely to counterbalance the concerns that come out of you know these other engagements. Um, and of course, uh, Pakistan Army was in Somalia alongside the U.S. Um, and and actually rescued U.S. soldiers during the Black Hawk Down incident. Um, so anyway, that's. You know, there's a lot more to be said there, but I'll, I'll just address that. Um, if I could quickly just make like a comment, but um, if we look at this from the other side, uh, it's it's quite interesting to see, you know, and I I know people have mentioned this before, but how the state sort of patholide, patholid, pathologizes um, uh, foreign fighters once it has once they've outlived their use. So you had a lot of fighters in Pakistan or in Afghanistan who during the 1980s, 1990s were you know very much lionized, and then after 2001 they sort of blanket you know, seen as foreigners. And, and like you mentioned, um, it's also kind of ironic, given that there were American soldiers and other, other foreigners too, who 
weren't mentioned in the same way. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I think that's something that that you know would merit a lot of uh, maybe a lot more interaction. Basically, the way that the state the state sort of uh, goes from lionizing to vilifying um, you know corners uh, when it when it uh, sees fit. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, Brother Marajatin, sorry, I'm not sure if your question, uh, you still have your question. Um, you raise your hand and then I don't know if because somebody else speaks, you put it down. If, if not, then we'll definitely come to you, inshallah. Um, for now, actually, let's go to Sister, uh, Dr. Katrin. Assalamu uh, alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Daryl, for your very interesting talk. I just have a comment uh, about uh, associating Ummah with a diaspora based on my book and my research that I did. I don't think it's fair to um, equate Ummah with a diaspora. Uh, it's definitely true that a part of the Muslims today are diasporic, but that's a very small percentage and a very small part. The biggest percentage of Muslims today, and I would say the Muslim Ummah, not just the Ummah because I made uh, differentiation between Ummah and Muslim Ummah in my book. So if you talk about the Muslims specifically, the Muslim Ummah, a large part of them live in nation states, what we call today the nation states, but they actually um, have a much longer history and much longer legacy that is based on ideology and based on which actually fueled or built in culture, ethics, morals, beliefs, a whole way of life. So there is a sense of, of pride associated with being part of the Muslim Ummah. So for example, me as a Muslim who come originally from Lebanon in the Middle East, and then I go to Indonesia, right? The other side of the world, which is completely different from me and you know, like my culture and all of that. But then I feel when I go to Indonesia, which is predominantly Muslim, I feel the sense of, of being home like, you know, there's so much similarity in the culture, in the ethics and the morals and the way of life. I have, this is what I call being part of the Muslim Ummah. It feels, uh, it, it's, it's, it's different from being in, in a diaspora because a diaspora are people who actually fled their homes um, because of persecution or anything and they live in a minority somewhere else. And I said, this is part of the Ummah today part of the Ummah today in the modern age, but that's a very small part. So that's the only, uh, my only sort of concern of equating uh, um, Muslim Ummah specifically, again, to be precise, because I don't think Ummah as a concept is the same as the Muslim Ummah. So equating Muslim Ummah specifically with the diaspora, I just have a, sort of a, a problem with that. And if uh, Daryl and, and Bassett want to comment on that, uh, that would be great, but that's that's just my uh, input. Thank you. Uh, before we come to them, actually, this echoes one of our written questions that has been submitted from Sayyid Mustafa Ali of, is the figure of the network possibly of value in theorizing the ummatic beyond the logics of the nation state and the diasporic as the non-closure of the latter? So whoever wants to start, we've come to Dr. Lee a lot. Dr. Bassett, would you like to start, sir? Sure, thank you. I'll, I'll just be brief. I think um, earlier what what uh, I, I was quoting Salman Sayyid on, on kind of thinking about a Muslim diaspora in, in response to uh, to Yahya. And I think um, what, what I found most interesting about that wasn't the the uh, accommodation of the term diaspora, but where at the end of that quote, he says, the inability of the ummah to articulate itself as a universal means that it is caught in the logic of diaspora, meaning that the uh, at least at least there he's not advocating for uh, the ummah to be you know let's not say it's like a nation let's say it's, it's like a diaspora he's saying rather that um, that there's a limit of articulation that it the ummah has not fully articulated itself as universal and so the terms that we are left with you know we have the we, we have the terms of economy of um of of nation of civilization uh perhaps of diaspora but i think he's he might be he might, he might be pointing to a further uh limit there right asking us to think further beyond that concept or beyond that logic of diaspora um and so and so likewise i i very much agree i don't think diaspora uh, quite is sufficient if we are taking the the logic of diaspora as mirrored on that of 
um, a, a racial or ethnic uh, minority or uh, kind of the, the inverse of the nation state or something like that. Um, but I'm, I'm keen to think more about this notion of the network and what it might uh, help us work through. Okay, great. Let's um, go to one written question. Uh, and then we have two more. And then we're coming up to the end now. So we have one more uh, question from our audience and then one more question from a panelist. But first, one of our written questions from uh, Ahmed bin Qasim. It's quite long, so I'll paraphrase. But the fundamental question is, how do you see the relationship between the nation state paradigm and the practice of jihad? couched in ummatic transnationalist terms. So for example, different Muslim fighters in Kashmir narrate their struggle against the Indian occupation as jihad, but at the same time, they define their liberation as a merger with Pakistan, which they see as not just any other nation state, but as a homeland for Muslims. But then there's the question of the Uyghur struggle, which Pakistan, due to its closeness with China, has largely obfuscated. So how does the reality of the nation state order affect jihad movements and affect their universalism? Um, that's it. Dr. Lee, would you like to come in and then we'll go back to if Dr. Bassett has some comments? Yeah, no, I think this is a great question because it puts the finger on exactly what's important about uh, contemporary jihad practices, right? I mean, we're talking about jihad in uh, like what I call like a world of sovereigns, right? So any practice of jihad as armed violence today has to contend with the question of the nation state, right? Either you're trying to set up a new nation state by splitting off from another, or you're trying to take over an existing nation state, or even if you're trying to organize on a non-nation state basis, right? Like Al-Qaeda, for example, you know, in a way, and this gets back to the network question, you know, the Al-Qaeda project is, um, it's kind of refreshingly agnostic, I feel, on the question of nation states, but it certainly has a target of a nation state, which is the United States. But in a way, the critique of the United States is almost that it is acting in a non-nation state way, right? I.e. that it's acting you know, in an imperial way. Um, so, but all of the points in the, in the question are, are exactly the kinds of the things that people need to ask, right? Like what is you know, what is the stance on the nation state? And, you know, there's many invocations of jihad where I think the question is relatively straightforward, right? Like Hamas, Hamas is fighting for a Palestinian nation state. They just have a different vision for how that state should function and, and constitute itself, say, than Fatah, right? Um, but even, yeah, even for mobilizations that are not explicitly within that container, they still have to, they still have to have a, a, a position on this question in, in the concrete situations from which they're emerging. Okay, any, any thoughts, Dr. Bassett, or? I was gonna pass it to Daryl in terms of okay. jihad in a world of sovereign, so that, that was it. Okay, no problem. Um, okay, let's um, go to brother uh, Shafat Wani. Uh, before we come back to the panelists. Sorry, am I audible? Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, just one interaction. Uh, brother, I have been, uh, yeah, yeah, but I uh, know he was saying something about Umar's diaspora conditions, critiqued Salman Said, and, and it should be an example of Kashmir uh, and not getting enough attention when it comes to Bosnia as it being center uh, in 1990s and non Kashmir. Uh, I would actually disagree uh, with it when it comes to the jihadist movement uh, in Kashmir in 1990s. Uh, uh, there was a very interesting, you know, uh, exchange between uh, foreign militants or foreign mujahideen, which we call mehman mujahideen. Mehman is an Urdu term that means the guest mujahideen coming to Kashmir, and then Kashmiri fight Kashmiri mujahideen going to Bosnia and fighting, uh, uh, fighting for the Bosnians or, or or protesting for the Bosnians and all uh, or, or some other omatic issues throughout the world. Uh, uh, apart from that, there's, there's this 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 uh, the the foreign uh, mujahideen or, or the Mahman mujahideen finding the vocabulary in Kashmiri uh, symbols of folklore and sloganing and political theologies 
justifying their presence in Kashmir uh, as an agent for uh, imagining the future beyond the conception of nation state structure. Uh, apart from that, just, just one interjection to, to, to uh, what Brother Ahmed bin Qasim was saying here. I, th I think when he, when he says, brings this paradox between Pakistan not supporting the Uyghur cause and, and Kashmiris uh, imagine their, uh, their, their, their freedom beyond the conception of nation state structure and but yet at the same time we see this, this, this with the merger of Pakistan, I think I think, I think when, when Kashmiris talk about this, it's, it's, it's purely on the basis of the way the idea of Pakistan was imagined. Maybe it was, maybe the Kashmiris think that people who are rejected by the merger is that, that the Takmir Pakistan, the project of Pakistan is still incomplete and, and it needs to be completed in that sense. So basically maybe Pakistan as a project was not a nation state structure, it was, it was something beyond that, but it's trapped in a paradox of nation state, that's, that's a, something that's different uh, different thing. But just one question to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 brother Daryl, uh, I mean, uh, Daryl, uh, so when I could see your work and I, I see it, I mean, it's a conceptualizing of omatic solidarity existing beyond the real polity of nation state structure uh, uh, and the idea of Muslim transnational solidarity and based on global jihad and Muslim lands as a counter hegemony project. Uh, how do you see your work? Uh, when we when we see when when we see Jamil Aydin's work or idea of Muslim, uh, uh, you know uh, his his work of, of talking about that the way uh, uh, the Muslim empire states or the Muslim nation states conceptualize Muslim interests is not the way that that's there basically the way it's portrayed as a civilization state or, or as a one single uh, monolith it's not there. So how how do you make distinction in that sense, there? Um, yeah, thank thank you. you. You know, thank you for that wonderful intervention. And uh, I wasn't aware that uh, that the idiom for uh, for non Kashmiri Mujahideen is, is uh, Mehman Mujahideen. That makes a ton of sense in the Bosnian context. They're called Ansar, um, and but there's other places where uh, they're the the foreigners are called the Muhajirun and the Ansar are the local people, right? So all of this to say is these uh, ways of configuring social relations. They might draw from a common vocabulary, but they end up being deployed in very different ways. And they aren't necessarily limited to the Arabic tradition, right? Precisely through this invocation of Mehman, which is so fascinating. And, and thank you. I, I, I'm so happy to have learned about this. Um, uh, your question, oh, right. In terms of Jamil, yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah, no, Jamil is actually one of my teachers. Uh, I think my first class on anything related to uh, the, the Middle East or Muslims or whatever, actually, Jamil was, was my teacher. So I, I, have, I have like a real soft spot for him. Um, I um, I guess what I would say is, you know, I there's, there's different ways of reading that book, but I feel that he kind of eventually comes down on the side of, um, again, trying to dispel the fear of Ummah. Um, by sort of saying, well, look, you know, it's not, you know, it's partially a sort of uh, European invention and, um, and you know, there, it's, it can't possibly account for the incredible diversity and complexity of actually existing Muslim societies. So um, I, I, I understand where he's coming from on that. And I don't think he's entirely closed the door to more productive invocations of Ummah, but I I feel I mean I don't know Basit you might have other thoughts on this but I feel that that's not really where his energy is um, so in that sense I feel like th my project is is heading in a slightly different direction even though I'm you know very much indebted to him intellectually um, but I don't know like Basit do you think I'm I'm misreading him or taking it the wrong way no no I, I mean like I feel like um, there are moments in the book I think where he he wants to insist that Umma is a properly theological term. Um, which which ends up only you know he, he talks about like you know perpetuating the illusion of geopolitical Muslim unity today, um, but uh, I think many of the of the the characteristics that he develops for you know this globalized Muslim world as as like a spatial body, as uh, having like a civilizational force behind it, th th these different features that he develops kind of uh, contributing to the formation of the Muslim world as it departs from that properly theological category of the Ummah, many of those features are taken up and scrambled around and used in sometimes competing ways as well. And so I think, um, I think, I think, I think uh, uh, parsing those, after parsing those, uh, 
we're left with a concept of Ummah that isn't simply theological, maybe in the terms that he um, ends with. Okay, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we only have time for one final question. Um, Brother Maraj uh, we'll come to you. I'm very sorry, Ibrahim and Dr. Katrin, but if you would prefer to perhaps, if your questions are more comments, feel free to put them in the chat box and um, people can see. But go ahead, Brother Maraj before we wrap up. I'm really sorry for my absence. Uh, uh, starting with an anecdote in Kashmir, we call in Kashmir OIC, oh, I see of its inability to, to, to make any substantial uh, contribution to, 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 to any of the causes in the Muslim world. So I come from Kashmir. Uh, I may not be able to add much to the theoretical part of this discussion, but I, I have been living in Kashmir for the past 34 years. I shifted to Istanbul last year. And when I think of thematic solidarity, and I, when I think of, of, uh, of, of thinking beyond the idea of other national, other universalisms and talk of creating a, an Islamic universalism or a Muslim universalism. And then as uh, Shafat uh, rightly pointed out, we call, we used to call uh, Afghani, Pakistani, Boston, Mujahideen as Mahman, Mujahideens as, as guests. And also when Kashmiri Mujahideens who were not able to, as, as Shafat also pointed out that Kashmiri liberation struggle as Arnold struggle started in 1989. And those Kashmiris who went to Pakistan for armor training in thousands and came back after the training, they were not able to galvanize much support when you compare that support to what happened in Bosnia or what transpired in Bosnia. So in one way, we see that the idea of Ummah translating on ground, something in action in Bosnia, but unable to do something substantial as Yahya Britt mentioned in terms of Kashmir the failure of Ummah in, in those terms. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask that, that uh, do you think as also Ahmad ibn Qasim asked that Pakistan as a nation state, while being partially able to support, support Muslims in Kashmir was, is unable to make any substantial change on the ground in vis-a-vis -vis with the problem of Uyghurs. So how do you see or how do you translate this inability of not only Pakistan, but of the Muslim world in diaspora, out of diaspora, Muslim countries as nation states and diaspora as an ummah within the Muslim world and outside the Muslim world. How do you see it making any substantial change on ground when it comes to the problem of Muslims in Palestine or in Kashmir, when it comes to practice, when it comes to action? Is there any future? As you said that that ummah is... is is not actively involved. Is not being able to do anything substantial in terms of in terms of action. So, so how do you think that transpiring on ground or, or in future? Doctor Leo, Doctor Basit, anyone want to make any final remarks on that? Hard question. <laughs> so the, the hardest to last. Uh, I'll, I'll just say quickly that I think um, the inability of any worldly endeavor, especially a nation state, to fully occupy and lock down and monopolize concepts such as Ummah is always reason for hope. Um, it's also a source of frustration, right, if you're trying to organize things sometimes. But um, I think, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a possibility that's there as an aspirational horizon. That's kind of what I've been trying to highlight, I mean, in terms of probabilities, I have no idea. And especially if we talk about the, you know, the um, concrete empirics of like Pakistan and its relationship with, with China, of course, and Kashmir, like, you know, there's plenty of grounds to be pessimistic, but I think it's precisely the fact that no one really can own the Ummah that, you know, there'll always have to be an accounting for other possibilities. Dr. Bassett, any, any final remarks? I mean, it's hard to it's hard to follow that up. I, I think a, my my own pessimism maybe might be one reason why I ended up looking at uh, disappearance of the ummah as one form of its appearance. Partly also as a response to the uh, anthropologist who wanted to only uh, see the, the category of the ummah as kind of an ideological mask, because 
um, there are these moments, right, where the the fellow feeling among the Muslims is felt so uh, strongly, even in the moments of its absence, right? And so even if uh, OIC is sitting back and saying OIC, oh, um, there is still that that um, that you know that, that that strong fellow feeling that, um, however it's figured, if, if it's whether it's figured uh, in the form of an interruption, whether it's figured in the form of a ruin, if whether it's figured in the form um, of some other configuration of of loss, right? I think it's often um, quite quite quite. Uh, at that point, I think you can turn to what to investigating what that form is, right? To understand what possible relationships there might be to to other Muslims at that particular time. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Lee, Dr. Bassett, everybody who contributed. It's been a really, really great discussion. Alhamdulillah. Just before we end, I'm going to hand over very quickly to Dr. Anjum for just some final uh, closing remarks. Dr. Thank Anjum. you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah, and uh, everybody else. Also, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, this has been really, really amazing. Um, I could sit back and listen to this discussion for hours, especially Daryl and Basit. Um, this is just uh, too short of a time to, to tease out all the wonderful um, allusions and possibilities in your discussion. Um, and, and this is really the best kind of uh, umatic discussion. Um, that uh, the Umatics Colloquium um, is, is established for. Uh, I want to therefore close with a heavy hop. I know it lots of questions and I hope also that um, many of you who are here um, have many more things to say and to contribute. So let me just end with this call. Um, we have established the Omatic Institute of which Omatics Colloquium is part. Um, and the purpose of Omatics uh, Institute is to um, echo this Omatic feeling, uh, both intellectually, but also effectively. Um, and to um, make it also um, allow it to be a, an, an analytic category, a category uh, that uh, that is able to serve as a kind of universalism and with hope also that as we think about alternative forms of universalism, I don't think we can live without universalism, right? As, as soon as human beings, our horizons open up and so that's where I wish I had a chance to ask Daryl about, you know, when he says all universalisms have sort of almost a tragic side, I think that's inevitably true for all human endeavors, but because they are structurally different, right? Or perhaps there is also a chance uh, for improvement and a chance to think uh, perhaps how our universalisms can be more ethical, can be better grounded um in human need and truth and in, in ultimate truths in god and so um that is really what the omatics uh, institute is trying to do to invite um people around the world uh, muslims and non-muslims to to allow the ummah the muslim ummah as dr catherine very uh, rightly pointed out allow the muslim ummah a chance to be the Muslim Ummah and to do, if you will, recognize the aspirations of Muslims to, to improve and save and, uh, the humanity by what they have, rather than always seeing that as a, a nefarious, subversive effort that Muslims must uh, contribute to human problems and or rather human solutions uh, to our great problems uh, as Muslims. And I hope that the Umatics Institute and, and, and all of you who are here think about your own ways of contributing to, uh, to that discourse. Um, more practically, uh, become members of the Colloquium and the Institute, visit our website. The next few weeks, we're going to be launching an Umatics uh, website, which will 
uh, build on the colloquium, but we'll have more activities and more possibilities. So please join our mailing list and stay in touch. Thank you very much all for showing up. So Mariko. Thank you, Dr. Anjum. Uh, thank you to everybody, as Dr. Anjum said, for, for coming today and to all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Iqbal, for participating in the conversation. Um, before we go, I'd just like to encourage everybody to subscribe to our email newsletter and our social media channels. The, the links have been put in the chat box, I believe. And as Dr. Anjum said, the launch uh, of our new website will hopefully is, is upcoming in the coming in the next couple of weeks before the end of the month. Uh, our next colloquium is also only a few weeks away. It will be on November 9th, inshallah, and we will have actually uh, Rabbi Yahya Bert speaking on his recent report released by Ayan Institute entitled Ummah at the Margins, the Past, Present and Future of Muslim Minorities. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Uh, until next time, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I'm like everyone.